my little tiny screen here. <laughs> All right, give, um, give me a second here. All right. All right, hopefully I am live. I'm trying to figure out how to see what's going on here. So give me just a minute to get started and I'm gonna give everybody a minute to join. Hopefully this is posting to, oh, yay, there we are. We are on there. <laughs> okay. Um, so we're going to be talking about cooperative counter conditioning um, with the Control Unleashed program. And uh, I will say uh, I'm going to be winging it because we wanted this to be very casual and it was supposed to be people talking, but it's hard to talk about Control Unleashed without videos um, to sort of demonstrate the concepts. So I might um be doing some live demonstrations with my own dogs um depending on what sort of questions i get or um what sort of feedback um but um we'll just sort of see how it goes oh and i'm not sure how, oh there we go i was gonna say i'm not sure how to see comments so if people can <laughs> okay yay yay jamie all right, so um, let me just first do a little bit of introduction about Control Unleashed. So this is based on Leslie McDevitt's books. Um, there are currently three books out. Um, the first one sort of introduced the concept of Control Unleashed, which is really about conversational training. It's about knowing how to read your dog and understand what they're communicating and responding to what your dog is telling you. So it's really about um, setting up a structure and adjusting to set your dog up for success um, and really paying attention to, um, you know, if your dog is struggling, why are they struggling? How can we change that environment? How can we set up more structure? Give them more feedback. Um, and it's really... Um, foundational training so setting up a really nice strong foundation so that your dog can be successful um, in in whatever it is that you want to do so successful in sports successful in just day-to-day -day living um, successful in um, competition so you know it's 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 so flexible and applies in so many different ways um, I've uh, sort of taken, it's sort of taken over all my classes. I don't really even teach manners classes anymore. It's really all about control and leash because if you have that foundation, you and your dog can really do anything. <laughs> um, so let's move on to um, the particulars. So I think I'm going to start with um, requested approach training because that one's um, near and dear to my heart. Um, and this is really a protocol um, not to put too fine a point on it, but it really is a protocol where your dog says, yes, someone can approach me, um, or alternatively, it can be set up for your dog to say, take me toward something. So it's very beneficial for dogs who are um, fearful, maybe of other people, of other dogs, um, for dogs that are reactive, um, again, the stimuli could be other people, other dogs, wildlife, um, although it's kind of hard to do requested approach training with wildlife, I would think, so scratch that one. Um, but uh, it's, it's utilizing a start button behavior. So for those of you that are not familiar with start buttons, this is sort of a new buzz thing, especially in cooperative care. Um, you've probably heard about start buttons, but it's a behavior that the dog performs in which the dog is telling you, yes, you can do a certain procedure. Um, so in the requested approach training, it would be the dog performs the start button, and that either means something can approach, or if you're doing the version where the dog is moving, them performing that start button behavior means take me toward that thing. Um, and so if I do the demo, you're going to see that um, a chin rest has sort of become my go-to start button. 
uh, because that's what I started off with my dog Piper and she has sort of generalized that. Um, so I sort of use that, um, that sort of as the start button and um, I use it in different contexts. And so the context really controls what that start button is telling me to do. Um, so when we're set up for request, requested approach training, um, I tend to be sitting next to her and she offers a chin rest on my leg. Um, and when she does that, that's her version of telling me, okay, yes, the scary person can approach or yes, the scary object can approach. Um, and I say object because I am going to share with you a video um, that I made when I was going through certification um, to become a Control Unleashed Certified Instructor. Um, and I did a video with my daughter as my helper and she was holding the bug zapper uh, because my dog does not like the bug zapper. And so we were using requested approach training to help her become more comfortable uh, with the bug zapper. Um, and so I'm gonna, I actually have that um, on my YouTube page. So I'm going to um, share that after the talk and um, you can sort of see it. And the nice thing about this protocol is it um, is structured so that it's very clear communication for the dog um, and for the helper. And so you'll find that that's a very common theme in Control Unleashed is that it's very clear communication um, to help set our learners up for success. So in the video that I'm talking about, I actually set up cones um, so that when my dog offered her chin rest that said, yes, my daughter could approach, my daughter would approach to the very next cone. So my dog knew exactly where she was going to go, exactly what that procedure was going to be. Again, it's predictable. Um, so that is also a very common theme in Control Unleashed is that predictability because when you know what's going to happen, that's going to reduce worry or anxiety. You feel more in control. Um, the dog is literally in control of the process. And so, again, start button, chin rest on the leg. That meant that the specific procedure of approach was about to happen. So my daughter would come to the next cone. At that point, I would mark the behavior, treat my dog out of place, so that she then has the opportunity to offer the start button again. Now, the difference between a start button um, and a cued behavior um, is that literally I'm not cueing the behavior. So my leg is always there. I'm not moving it or doing anything that cues the behavior. It's very clear to the dog um, that they have a choice of offering that behavior or not. And give me one second because somebody just had a question. Oh, and it disappeared. Have deleted my question because you just, okay, well, there we go. <laughs> I was going to say, I saw that there was a question. Um, and then, uh, yes, okay, so moving right along. Um, so how we turn the learned behavior into a start button, because obviously the first thing I had to do was teach her to do a chin rest. Um, I turned it into a start button behavior. Um, once she was offering that behavior and getting rewarded for it, so she figured out when she offered a chin rest on my leg, she was getting rewarded for it. So how I turned it into a start button behavior was I started to introduce the concept that offering that behavior meant someone was going to approach. So we always want to start with something that they're comfortable with. So we're not, I'm not gonna start with the bug zapper. For dogs that are fearful of the vacuum or fearful of strangers, I'm not gonna start with that stimulus. I'm gonna start with something that they're comfortable with. Um, so she would offer the chin rest and I would have my daughter take one step closer. I would mark with a yes or a click, depending on whatever your marker was. I would feed out of place. So I would put the treat so that she had to remove her chin from my leg. She would eat the treat. I would simply wait. If and when she put her chin back on my leg, my daughter would take one more step forward. So it became very clear very quickly that her offering that chin rest sort of, um, sort of like a domino effect, it caused that next thing to happen. Um, now, it's very important that you're learner understand that there is choice here. So especially for dogs that have a lot of training history, are very food motivated, or um, very quick, really wanting to please, um, 
that they're just going to be offering behavior because they think that's what's expected of them or they think that you're cueing it even though you're not intentionally cueing it. One of the things that we can do to um, help them to um, understand that this is a choice is you can also feed the no. So for example, when uh, we were actually doing this, and hopefully you'll see this on the video when I edited it, but there was a point where my um, dog did not put her chin on my leg. And um, at that point I could feed that. So even though she didn't do the behavior and I didn't say yes and feed, I can feed the no. So that getting reinforced isn't contingent on that behavior, it's, a clear understanding that you can say yes or you can say no. Um, another way is is to um, sort of respect that no by maybe changing the picture. Oh, this is a little too hard for you. You're not comfortable with this. How can we change this scenario so that we're going to get a yes? Um, and I understand that this is all very abstract. Um, so. Uh, I think I will just very quickly do a demo and I hope everybody's okay with that. I know a lot of these have sort of been talking, but um, I do have my dog here and I sort of have both of them in here. So let me start off just sort of doing a demo with start button and chin rest. Um, and then I can sort of talk you through at pretending that we have a helper here and sort of what it would look like. And again, please feel free to ask questions because um, I do know that this is extremely abstract with you guys not being able to see the videos. Um, with it, but I didn't want to do just a screen share. Um, so hopefully it will be helpful in seeing the demo, but um, I would love for you guys to ask questions. Yes, the feeding the no can be very critical. And it's, you know, and a lot of times we sort of get stuck there because it's like, oh, my dog isn't saying yes, what do I do now? Um, and there will be, so especially when I do the um, demo with the voluntary sharing, my Piper, my, my uh, female, the black lab mix, um, has said no. There have been many times where once she figured out that her offering that start button behavior meant that I was going to feed the other dog first and then her, um, there were some definite no's. And even doing cooperative care, there are some times where I get some no's. And I have found that feeding the no, she might say no again and I feed the no again, she's much more willing to say yes after that because she's like, okay, I can say no and it doesn't mean that I'm not gonna get reinforced for that um, or that I'm not gonna get the treats and the treats are contingent on me saying yes, I do have that freedom of choice and she's much more willing to say yes. Um, and it's really beautiful because it is that clear communication. That's when you really know that your dog understands that it is a start behavior because they know that if they do that, then that procedure is going to happen and they may not be comfortable with that procedure. Um, and so again, that's data that we, oops, we maybe went too far too fast. We need to adjust so that they're more comfortable, but it really does help them. Um, oh yeah, I do have choice in this and I'm going to say no. And now that I know I can say no, I think I'm more willing to say yes. Um, so let me go ahead and do a quick demo. I may end up having two dogs in here. Um, in the demo, even though I just really want to show you sort of the start button aspect. Um, I'm hoping that you guys can see me if I, let me see if I can tilt this down because I, I tend to do this with her where I'm on the floor. So let me see if I can angle that down a little bit. Okay, good. You should be able to see me on the floor. So I tend to sit cross-legged on the floor and that sort of cues her to know that she can offer a chin rest on my legs. So you're going to find it fairly quickly. Yeah, she's, he's in the way. Come here, Obi. But she just offered me that chin rest. Yes. And I unintentionally had my food there, so I'm going to move that. Yes, I almost got a double dog chin rest there. All right, so in theory, let's pretend that my daughter was in the room. Her chin would go down. I would then tell my daughter to take one step forward. She would take her step forward. I would say yes, and I would feed out of place, which gives my dog the opportunity to then offer the chin rest again, which she is. Yes, good doggies. And I didn't get I didn't get very many treats. So I apologize for that. Um, and I think we'll, we can do a demo of, um, when we do the demo of voluntary sharing, um, because I do have two dogs, it might make it a little bit easier to sort of see that start button aspect. 
Um, but I also really want to encourage you to go check out um, Leslie McDevitt's Control Unleashed program YouTube page um, because she has started adding more videos and one of the videos that she has on there um, that I know is up there, there might be more, is requested approach training with her um, puppy Sage, who was a puppy at the time. And she just happened to have a friend over who had a crying baby. And she thought, oh, what a great opportunity for Sage to get comfortable around a crying baby. And so she did the same thing where she just, you know, sat down on the ground. She had her legs out in front of her, which is her dogs recognize as a cue um, to offer that chin rest start button. So Sage rested her chin on um, her leg. The woman holding the crying baby approached when Leslie marked and uh, fed out of position, the person turned and walked away. Um, so one of the things that is paired in the Control Unleash program is approaches are always paired with retreating. So for a dog that is worried about something, um, it's really nice to learn within this context that approaching does not mean you're going to get stuck. It doesn't mean that the dog has to stay there or that the person is going to stay there and there's some forced interaction. Approaching is always paired with that retreat to relieve that social pressure. Um, and in relieving that social pressure, they're probably more comfortable to do it again. And so it's not that, ooh, something happens and I get stuck there. It immediately you have that relief and then the dog may be more willing to go up um, and all of those and the um, uh, I would I, I don't know that it's as clear with requested approach training as it is with another protocol called look at that um, but I would in my understanding of it and how I have done it requested approach training does not involve interacting with the stimulus so the stimulus would be approaching and retreating, but there would not be, like the person wouldn't come up and then start petting the dog, for example. Um, if the dog got to the point where they were comfortable enough that you felt that they could interact, you would want to end the protocol, um, very clearly end it for the dog. You could ask for a different behavior, you could do a release cue, something else that ends this protocol before starting an introduction so or, or a sort of go say hi type thing. Um, so we want to make it really clear um, that the dog is safe within this context and they know exactly what's going to happen. Um, so again the sequence is dog offers start button behavior that cues um, person to approach, dog is marked, fed out of place so that they can offer the start button again. All right, so there are a couple terms, um, and again, I apologize because we're getting a little abstract, but I do want to go over these things because there are a couple variations that are possible. So the chin rest is what we refer to as a duration start button behavior. So it's um, something that the dog um, can perform with duration, so they can do it for a while. The nice thing about a duration start button is it makes it really clear when the dog says no. So for example, if I had had uh, Piper with her chin down and I had just told my daughter to keep approaching and at some point Piper took her chin off my leg, that would be a very clear, oh, you're getting too close and the person needs to retreat um, because they are performing that behavior continuously. So it makes it very easy to see that no. Um, there is another type of start, be uh, start button behavior, Ooh, that's a tongue twister, um, that we refer to as a one and done. So for example, um, those little easy buttons that you press and it says something. Um, so there um, are a lot of uh, trainers that are using those for various reasons, but that could in theory be a start button. Um, in fact, I've seen it as a start button, um, but the dog you know, presses the button and that cues something to happen. So in the case of requested approach training, if you were using that as a one and done, the dog would push the button, the person would take that one step forward, the dog would get fed, and then the dog would then have the choice to push the button again to tell the person to take one more step forward. Um, with the duration, you do have that option of having a continuous movement. Um, with the one and done, I would say it's much more of a set distance um, for the person to travel. 
So now that we've talked about duration start button versus one and done, I wanna talk about how um, requested approach training would be done with the dog moving. And um, a fellow uh, certified control unleash instructor, um, she and I did a um, joint talk about this subject on uh, for the control um, conference unleashed, which was the um, conference that took place last Halloween for control unleashed. And she had some videos there of her dog Flash, who, as she describes it, Flash has big feelings um, about things that happen um, when they would compete in agility. Um, and so this was an area that um, he had difficulty with. And um, so uh, Adam figured out how to um, utilize requested approach training to help Flash give very clear yes or no, whether or not he wanted to continue with the agility. So she, he had a, um, he knew how to hold something in his mouth. And um, she referred to this as a very fragile behavior because it was, it was well-trained and that he knew how to do it, but it was very fragile because anything that he was uncomfortable with meant that he would stop the behavior. So she felt it was a really nice start button to have because it would be very clear if and when he became uncomfortable. And so in this case, he was performing a duration behavior because he was holding on to the object in his mouth. At any time, he could drop the object, which would be a stop um, button. So when we, when, if he were to drop it, it would mean, okay, we're done. But in this case, it was when he was holding it in his mouth, that meant that they were moving forward. So holding it in his mouth meant dog could approach. So he would, the, the item would be offered. If he took the item and held it in his mouth, that meant that they were good to go onto their next step in agility. So maybe going from one place to the next. Um, and so that was um, a variation of having the dog do the approach. Um, uh, there is one other video um, that I don't know if it's on the YouTube page or not, but hopefully it is, where um, it was uh, a video from Leslie McDevitt, and it was her dog, Ever, and Ever would offer a lean. So kind of like a lot of dogs that learn heel, they sort of lean in. So Ever would offer a lean to say, take me forward. So when she would lean um, against her leg, they would take a step toward, um, in this case, it was her son who was dressed up like a human fly. Um, so something that might be a scary stimulus. Um, and uh, I don't know, I think she might have done, um, no, I think that was a look at that. I don't think that was approach. But she also has a dragon that breathes smoke now. So that would be another one that would be a really good one to have the dog say, yes, take me close to that scary, um, scary stimulus. And so that's the variation where the dog moves instead of the scary, the scary stimulus moving. So I hope um, that was clear. Again, I know it's, it's really hard when you're not seeing it. Um, I would have loved to have been able to do... Um, a PowerPoint with this and sort of show you guys the videos as I'm talking about them. Um, but we can um, move on to voluntary sharing, although you're welcome to ask more questions about requested approach training, um, how, you know, how it can be utilized or what are some other examples, um, anything that you didn't understand. Uh, but I want to sort of shift over to voluntary sharing because I think that might be a little bit easier to demonstrate since I have the two dogs here. Um, and it will also be some good demonstration for um, start buttons and all of those. So voluntary sharing is to help dogs who resource guard. Um, so that can be food or toys or even people. Um, so this is a dog that guards a um, particular thing from other dogs. Um, I'm not sure I'm, there might be a way to adjust this for dogs that resource guard from people but I'm not, I'd have to think about that one but <laughs> typically we use it for resource guarding from other dogs um, it can also be used to um, have dogs become more comfortable with taking turns so um, the start button in the in the voluntary sharing with resource guarding typically the start button needs feeds the other dog so they, the dog does the start button it means the other dog gets fed and then they get fed out of place allowing them to offer the start button again. 
Um, with the taking turns scenario, um, it can be something like um, one dog going to a station to say that the other dog can take a turn playing tug or something like that. Um, so that's how you can utilize the program, the um, protocol for more of a taking turn type thing. Um, or again, for a dog that is maybe jealous of time with the handler, that dog going to the station can say, yes, the handler can now pay attention to the other dog. The dog then gets rewarded off of the station and then the dog can choose, do I want to go back on the station and say, yes, you can pay attention to the other dog or do I want a little more attention right now and then maybe later I can go back and say, yes, pay attention to the other dog. All right, so let me do um, a demo with the voluntary sharing with um, my two dogs here. And I don't think I was smart enough to get the bowls which might make it a little bit clearer. So let me, let me see if I can have somebody run me in some bowls, so that might make it easier. Um, little caveat, my dogs um, don't actually resource guard. Um, again, Piper, the um, black lab, she might be a little bit quick to make sure that she gets the food. Like if it was on the ground, she might be quick to get the food, but um, they, they, we don't have issues with that in this household. So I'm not setting up um, any management for safety. Um, obviously, if you do have dogs that actively resource guard, I know we're getting there, um, you're going to want to set up um, to structure this so that it's safe. So that might be um, some gates. It could involve crates. Um, whatever it is that you can set up um, your scenario so that, um, that everyone is going to be safe, that we're not going to be setting up um, a potential um, aggressive um, scenario. Um, and of course, if we're setting it up correctly, the dog should be really comfortable with this procedure before we're adding in that second dog. So ideally, you are going to um, set up this structure of your dog performing the behavior means that this is going to happen, but you're going to start when there isn't another dog there. Um, so I I can maybe kick one of the dogs out and show you what it looks like without the other dog. Um, I did take videos of all of this, but again, I didn't know how, I, I wanted you to be able to see me live rather than just seeing my stuff, so I didn't do that, but um, let me see if I can sort of demo this for you guys. So sort of winging it as we go, so apologies for the low tech here, but give me one second and let me see if I can kick one dog out, get some bowls, and then we'll sort of go through the procedure. All right. I know, you're excited, you're excited. All right, I can use these bowls. Yeah, let me see if we can do this. All right, Obi, I'm gonna have you go on the bed. Hey, Piper, can you come lay down? I know, we see food bowl and we're all excited. Let me get this out of here. Okay. Okay, Piper, come over here. She offered the chin rest. I'm going to say yes and feed in a bowl. She offers chin rest. I'm going to say yes and feed there. I'm sort of sneaking in the feeding him. <laughs> okay. So now I'm going to have this other bowl in my hand. She offers the chin rest. I'm going to put the food in this bowl first and then her bowl. She offers the chin rest. I put the food in here. Yes. And then I put the food in hers. You're being very patient. You can see she's hesitating to do it this time. Her chin is not fully on my leg, so that's why I'm hesitating. She's anticipating. Yes. Okay. So now I'm going to give it to him. So I, so I sort of introduced it without feeding him first, and now we're going to see if now that he's got the bowl, if she's going to offer it to me again. So again, I'm going through this much faster than I would um, in a real-life scenario but I sort of want to, oh, she's sort of saying no. She can sort of say she's looking at me very distinctly and not offering that. So she's like, I don't really want you to feed him first. Let's see if she does it again. There we go. 
her chin came up because it's a duration behavior rather than a one and done. That's why I, yes, that's why I didn't do it when her chin came up. So in case you were wondering why I started and then stopped, her chin came up. So I took that as a no. Yes. Oh, good babies. All done. Sorry, I know that looks like dinner, but. <laughs> That would be an example of a duration start button with voluntary sharing of food um, with two dogs. So um, I, a one and done would again, I, um, I actually tried this with them, but uh, my dogs can be noise sensitive and they didn't really like the button, but a one and done uh, would be the dog pushes the button that says feed the other dog. So they push the button put the food in the other bowl or for the other dog, then feed the other one. And with the one and done, um, you wouldn't need the duration. So in the case of the chin rest, I wanted to make sure that her chin was staying there before I did the procedure. With the one and done, it's as soon as the dog pushes the button, that means food goes to the other dog, and then you feed this dog and wait and see if they push the button again. So, not getting a whole lot of feedback. So, <laughs> am I making sense? Uh, is there anything that you guys want to see that you didn't see or anything that I can explain clearer for you guys? Um, again, I wish that we had video for you, um, but definitely um, check out the links for um, my video on my YouTube and definitely um, Leslie McDevitt's YouTube should have, um, I believe it has some voluntary sharing with Ever, so Ever um, has a um, cup that she rests her chin on. So that's her um, start button. She puts her chin on this little cup that's between um, Leslie McDovitt's feet. And so when she's on there, Leslie would feed the other dog, then she would feed Ever out of place, and then Ever had the opportunity to put her chin back on the cup. Um, and there's also a lovely video, uh, which I hope is on there, where um, Ever would get on the station, which means that Leslie could play tug with Sage, her other dog, she would play tug with Sage. After a while, she would reward Ever off the station, and then Ever had the choice to go back on the station to say, yes, you can tug with Sage again. So I see 12 comments on there, but I don't, I apologize if you guys, oh, I didn't go down. I apologize if you guys were making comments and I didn't see any of them or ask any. All right, is there something you recommend to allow choice without using a second person? Um, Okay. Oh, yeah. La oh, there, there's Adam. Yay. Hi. Sorry. I wasn't seeing any of these comments, so I apologize. It didn't scroll down automatically. Silly me for thinking it would go to the most recent. Okay. So, uh, Jamie, is there something you recommend to allow choice without using a second person? Uh, I'm not sure which protocol you were asking about. So, uh, there are always scenarios to teach the dog that, a, that the, the, they have a choice to say yes or no with the start button. So it depends on what procedure you're doing, how you would set that up. So let's say you wanted to um, use, a, use a, a variation of requested approach training. Um, so instead of having a second person, um, let's... For, for example, like I said, my dogs are noise sensitive. Um, so I was, it's not really requested approach training, but it is using a start button to sort of have the same thing. Um, I was using a binder because the closing of the sound of the closing of the binder, my dog does not like. Um, so I was having her make the choice of whether or not she wanted me to close the binder. Um, so I set it up by again, sitting down so that she has the opportunity to offer the chin rest. Um, I also wanted to do it so that um, it was very soft, so it wasn't very loud. So again, I didn't want to set it up for her to immediately say no. I wanted to set it up for her to say yes. Um, so I made it as soft as possible, so I had it a little bit of a distance away. Um, she offered a chin rest. I did a really nice soft close, fed her out of place, and waited to see if she offered the chin rest again. Let's say she didn't offer the chin rest again. I would then feed her again pause for a moment. So you sort of saw me with that example, I paused for a moment. Was she going to offer the chin rest again? Um, if she didn't, 
Um, I would probably feed the no again, and I would sort of debate, okay, do we want to be done with this session? Did I not set it up for successfully, and she's not ready for this? Is there some way I can make it easier? Um, or did that, maybe I could give her one more opportunity to say yes. Um, sometimes it, we do get two no's, and then she decides she wants to do yes. Sometimes it's a clear indication that she's done. Um, if we're talking voluntary sharing, ideally you would introduce that concept without any other anything else there. So like I have the two bowls, pretend my second dog wasn't there. Um, start off by having her offer a behavior um, and I reward that behavior by putting the food in the bowl. So in this case, we were doing the chin rest, um, but if I was to do an organic start button, which means you know some behavior that she was offering, so she likes to use her paws a lot, so let's pretend that she pawed at my leg, that could be the start button. She paws at my leg, I put food in her bowl, she eats it. She paws at my leg, I put food in her bowl, she eats it. She does that a couple times. I then get a second bowl. She paws at my leg, I put food in the second bowl, I then put food in her bowl. Pause, wait and see if she, if she, <laughs> pause and pause. <laughs> wait and see if she offers the behavior again. If she does, put food in the second bowl and then feed her. If at any point she doesn't offer that behavior, I would probably just put food in her bowl for her to eat and then pause and offer her the opportunity to do it again. So it very quickly becomes established that there is, um, there is opportunity for um, getting rewards even without always saying yes. And that's where that choice factor comes in. Um, and that's also data for us. If your dog is saying a lot of no's, then we have not set up our scenario very well. Ideally, we're setting up our scenario so that your dog wants to say yes that they're comfortable with it. If your dog isn't comfortable, then how can, and I'm saying you are, but let's say my dog, if my dog isn't comfortable, how can I change this setup and this scenario so that she's going to want to say yes? Um, so with the exa example of the binder, ooh, that was too loud. Maybe I needed a second person to have it far across the room, or maybe I could record the noise and that way I could control the volume and make it softer um, and a little bit easier for her. And if that wasn't going to work, maybe I should try with a different sound that's a little less aversive. Um, so there are all sorts of ways that we can change things up um, to set them up for success and establish that, um, that sort of process and understanding. Um, so before, I know people are asking questions, so let me go back very quickly because I missed a few. Okay, so... Um, Vicki said, you have put yourself in a position which offers the opportunity to chin rest. Is that not the same as a cue? Which is an excellent question. So, um, yes and no. <laughs> um, initially, my lying down certainly offered, um, offers that opportunity and she has the food. Um, but the, the only difference is that... Um, I'm not off, so I'm not doing anything in between. So let's say, yes, I sit down. That offers her the opportunity to offer a chin rest. I do reward that. Um, at that point, she could, she has all sorts of other things that she could do to get a treat. Um, like I said, she really likes her paws, so she could offer a down or a sit or some other thing. Uh, but typically, again, we have those context cues. So if I've got Obi in the room and she's there and I've got two bowls, she pretty much knows, okay, we're going to be doing voluntary sharing. Um, if we sit down and I've got nail clippers, she knows that, okay, we're going to be, you know, this start button is going to be that I'm going to be doing something with her paws. Um, if I'm offering a hand and she can do the hand target, that's what we tend to, that's what we use for um, brushing. So her resting her chin on my hand um, it says that I can brush her. Um, so, and, and again, how we sort of switch that from a cue to the start button is that ability to say no and that understanding that doing that, doing that behavior means a specific procedure will follow. Not doing that behavior means that procedure is not going to happen, but it doesn't mean that you won't get rewarded so that you have to do this or the treats aren't flowing. So I hope that answered your question, Vicki. Um, oops, sorry, moving things around in the wrong way. Okay. Lauren, how would you do this with a toy, e.g. a fairly, a fairly obsessed dog who guards it when out on walks? Okay, so is it guarding from you or guarding from other dogs would be my first question. 
And then um, again, you want to set up the scenario so that the dog is going to be successful. So if the walks are where the dog tends to guard the toy, I would start off not, not doing this on a walk. So I would start off in a location where the dog has never guarded the ball. Um, and then I would um, try to establish some sort of procedure where the dog, something that the dog offers naturally, um, is telling you to pick up the ball. So if it's you, then you pick up the ball. If it's another dog, then it might be nice to set up a behavior where, you know, ideally a station is what works really well in these scenarios, but obviously on a walk, you can't do the station. Um, so maybe it could be like heel position. So if you're the station, so your dog coming and sitting next to you cues you to throw that ball for another dog. Um, and obviously, if you were to do this and throw the ball, the dog that was just sitting next to you is probably going to chase it. So we would want to start off with something much lower key. So your dog comes and sits next to you. You very low key hold the ball out for another dog to sniff. You would reward your dog away from you. And then does your dog come back and sit next to you again? In which case you would then, again, offer the other dog a chance to sniff the ball. And then you would work up. So if that's okay, then you might drop the ball on the ground for the other dog to pick up. Reward your dog out of place. See if your dog again says, yes, the, the other dog can interact with the ball. Um, so it's really about setting up that procedure so that your dog understands exactly what's happening. So I can predict what doing this means. Um, and in a manner that your dog it has a chance, you know, is somewhat likely to say yes. So again, if you were to throw, toss the ball when your dog did that, your dog is most likely going to go after that ball and not say yes, give it to another dog. So how can we set it up so that your dog has the opportunity to say yes? And, it, and we may even start out with your dog sitting there being no other dog and you sort of doing something with the ball over here when there's no other dog around. If your dog's successful with that, feed them out of place. When they come back, you do the same thing. Um, so it's all about that early learning and then you start to add more and more to make it look more like the real scenario as your dog is successful. If, if we can't find a place where your dog is successful, then we, we can't, we, we can't start. So we have to figure out how to do that. All right. Thinking about, uh, nail trimming, what would be a good positional start button for that? So it really depends um, so for example, with the chin rest, I was initially trying that with my dog, but when her chin is on my leg, I can't see her paws. So that did not work for us. <laughs> um, so a lot of times having a, um, object that the dog would do a chin rest on would work. Um, for nail trims, ideally a great start button is the dog offering their paw. So I actually have been doing this with Obi because, um, he's my, my new dog. We've only had him for, um, a month. So um, he has, we, it actually started off because when I got him was when we had all of the rain and it was muddy and every time the dogs were coming in, I was having to wipe their paws. Um, and so he learned that if he offered a paw for me to wipe, he got a treat for doing that. So then he very naturally started offering his paw. And so what I did as a context cue, I started incorporating the nail trimmers. So him offering his paw, meant that I would touch his paw with the nail clippers. Um, if at any point I went to move the nail clippers to um, towards him and he moved his paw away, that was a very obvious no and a sign that I maybe went too fast. Not even maybe, I went too fast. Um, so then I would maybe just hold up the nail, nail clippers. So he offers his paw to my hand, I hold it, I hold up the nail clippers, I say yes, and then I treat out of place and then he either offers his paw again or he doesn't. So I can, again, show you really quickly because as soon as he sees I have treats, he's going to offer me a paw when I go down if, if we can get her out of the scenario. So I'm going to feed her. I'm going to sit down. My hand goes up and he's going to see my hand. Always oh, thinking about it. There it is. So he offers his paw and I feed. And if I had the nail clippers, I, I would probably just be touching. Yes. Oh boy. Yes, you're a good girl too. And in this case, my hand is going up as a cue for him um, because you could see he didn't offer his paw until my hand was there. I've been trying to switch it to him just putting his paw up on a leg or something like that so it's a little less an obvious cue. Um, but I've also just been resting my hand so that it's always there. So my motion of offering my hand isn't 
cueing it. Um, but again, if at any point he took his paw back or didn't offer it and said that obvious no, um, that would be a clear indication that um, I need to change my scenario. I would again feed the no, set things up a little bit differently, see if we could get a comfortable yes. Um, okay. So Jamie, yes, exactly. So Jamie was asking about using a Dremel with nail trims. Um, so I would probably, yes, I would start with um, having a behavior such as offering a paw um, or a chin butt, uh, chin button, pfft, chin rest start button um, without the Dremel involved. And then probably my next step would just be having the Dremel in the room, not doing anything with it have them offer that behavior, get rewarded for that. And again, this would be, a, these could be very short sessions. So 30 seconds here, 30 seconds there until the dog is really figured out that that behavior is a rewardable behavior. Um, make sure the dog will still offer that behavior when the Dremel is in sight. And then if they're doing really well, then it might be dog offers the behavior. I reach toward the Dremel feed make sure that they are comfortable offering the behavior again for me to reach toward. If I were to reach toward it and they didn't offer it again, okay, we're not quite comfortable with that. So maybe we need to do, um, how can we set it up to have an intermediate step there? If they're comfortable with that, then maybe I just pick it up, maybe I show it and all of that. And depending on your dog's comfort level is how quickly you're gonna move through those steps. But having those short steps of, okay, now I'm holding the Dremel, now I might be touching the Dremel, um, or, we could have an intermediate up step of I'm holding the Dremel, I turn it on, turn it back off, reward. Um, and so it's just how how you put all of those in sort of depends on your, your dog. And it's really, again, all about that conversational training. Um, and I just want to point out something that um, Adam would uh, say for sure is watch for those little no's. You want to be sure that your dog doesn't have to give you a big no, um, that you're respecting and responding to those little no's. So your dog offers the paw and they don't maybe take it away and they're still offering it, but they, they're not really sure about that. That right there is probably an indication that they're not as comfortable as we'd like. How can we make them more comfortable so we're getting that really confident, here's my paw. Um, because if if you're in doing one of these sessions and your dog gets up and walks away, that's a that's a pretty big no, and there were probably some small no's in there um, that weren't being picked up on. And again, we we want to build that trust. We want them to have trust in the system um, and to trust us, so that um, that they're comfortable saying that yes because they know exactly what's going to happen and they trust that contract. Um, okay. Do you find the dogs offering the yes button at other times when you're not doing the training? E.g. just now when you're on the computer chair, do they come and offer chin rest to try and get treats? Um, there, you will find that there are many dogs who offer those chin rests, yes. <laughs> um, Piper honestly doesn't tend to do that when I'm sitting down. It tends to be um, more in a training scenario, probably because from the time that she learned it, it immediately became a start button. Um, and, and I did sort of generalize it to a start button in different contexts. Um, so depending on where we are and what I have, she knows what it means, but um, she doesn't often come up and offer a chin rest on my leg like when I'm sitting in a chair or something. Probably because most of the time I don't work with her when I'm sitting in a chair or sitting on the couch or something like that. Um, however, I've seen many pictures from fellow trainers where their dogs have come up and offered beautiful chin rests. <laughs> So what I would say is, um, I yes, I would reinforce, but not necessarily every time. Um, so we want it to still be a reinforceable behavior. Obviously, in that context, they know it's not a start button because um, there isn't a stranger there that we're going to be doing requested or post training. You don't have nail clippers out to do nail trimming, or there isn't another dog there that they're telling you to go tug with or something like that. Um, they just know it as something that that starts a conversation with you. Um, and so I would probably look at that more as a your dog wanting to start a conversation, in which case I would definitely respond um, and sort of pay attention to that in that sense. So 
it might be feeding a treat, especially if I'm eating a nice yummy sandwich and my dog came up and offered a chin rest, that would be a very clear, are you willing to share some of that sandwich? <laughs> um, so I, I don't know that I would ignore, I, I, I do, okay, I would not ignore it is the short answer. How I would respond to it would depend on what I'm doing at the time, um, what's going on. So for example, for a dog that tends to be anxious about things, if the dog came over and offered a chin rest and I suddenly became aware that my children were running all around the place and yelling, my dog might be asking for um, some help with dealing with that um, chaotic environment. So um, that would be a cue to me that I maybe need to help her out. So maybe um, I could be reinforcing her for offering some look at that in that scenario, or even just the chin rest itself. Oh, great job. I could feed her out of place. If she felt the need to offer the chin rest again, we're having a conversation where Ooh, I'm a little concerned. I'm a little worried about what's going on. Um, and I just want you to help me feel better about that because within this scenario, I know exactly what's going to happen. Um, th there's, you know, there's a predictable sequence of events. I feel in control of it. It makes me feel more comfortable. Um, and I'm happy to have that conversation with my dog whenever they feel the need. Um, yes, yes, Lauren. I mean, that, that basically is control unleashed right there is it's, all of the different ways that we can structure a conversation with our dog so that they know how to communicate with us and we understand what it is they're trying to communicate. Um, that is what I love about this, this program. Um, Lauren, yes, so guarding a ball from other dogs. So in that scenario, uh, yes, I would, I would definitely do it outside of the walk. I would start off with the dog by itself where the dog offers some behavior that has you doing something with the ball that is not that dog holding it in their mouth or chasing it or getting it. Um, and again, you know, it could be, um, you know, or an organic one might be something like sitting next to you, leaning against you, um, laying down, some sort of behavior that your dog offers naturally. If you wanted to train a very specific start button, you could. Uh, but you would want it to be something that your dog could utilize on a walk. So it could be that you offer your hand out, your dog puts their chin on your hand, and that cues you to do something with the ball for other dogs. Um, so, and again, think we need to think about what we want our, what our long-term goal is in this scenario. So it isn't necessarily for your dog to say, another dog can play with a ball, it's for your dog to feel more comfortable about other dogs having a ball or playing with the ball. Um, and so your dog being the one able to make that choice and say yes they can or no they can't, again, might make them more willing to say the yes. Um, and so we want to set up a situation where your dog figures out that they, their um, behavior control, it controls this situation and um, it's about setting up those steps so that they can say yes. So can you do something with a ball that doesn't involve them, doesn't involve them going over and get it? Okay, yes, we can. So can we then have that ball be a little more exciting or doing something? Can we get a stuffed dog and your dog cues you to offer the ball to the stuffed dog? Okay, yes, that's good. And so then what are all these steps that we can work up to your dog being on a walk with your other dogs and not, um, you know, tearing the head off? of another dog <laughs> if they go for the ball. Um, and you know, obviously there are some other, and I don't know what it looks like, I'd have to get more details to give you specific, but that's sort of an overview. You know, if, if having every dog have their own ball doesn't solve the issue because your dog wants every single ball that's out there, um, then obviously, you know, we're gonna need a lot of management and a lot of that stuff. But that is sort of the idea. And oh my gosh, time flies, it's 53 minutes, yay! At 30 minutes, I wasn't sure we were gonna have enough to keep going. <laughs> um, is there anybody else that has any questions about either protocol, um, some a demonstration that might make things clearer? Um, again, I highly, highly, highly encourage you to check out the videos on uh, the YouTube page. Um, I believe it's Leslie McDevitt's Control Unleashed program. Um, I will put a link to that and um, my page, um, my YouTube page, so you can see those videos. Um, and yeah, all right. So anything else?
we can start uh, wrapping up here if people don't have other questions for me. Hopefully I um, touched on everything. Um, and obviously start buttons are, um, there are just so many ways you can utilize start buttons, but they are a key um, concept of these two particular protocols. Um, but uh, you, you can use them in other things like cooperative care. Um, and you fi you'll find that once you start using start buttons, um, they'll just become pervasive um, because it's just, it's so nice to know that your dog is telling you, yes, you can do this. Um, anything from putting the leash on when your dog comes over and sniffs the leash. Okay. That means you can put the leash on for dogs that are uncomfortable with putting their harnesses on the dog. Same thing. The start button can be your dog sniffing the harness or, um, you know, those types of things. Oh, thank you, Eva. <laughs> um, so there are just so many ways you can utilize it. Um, but, uh, yeah. I, I just, I adore requested approach training. Um, I've used that a lot more. I have just started to use the voluntary sharing and I hope to be using that more with um, clients that have um, dogs that resource guard or maybe struggle um, with that concept of um, taking turns. Um, oh, I did, the one thing I didn't go over was for dogs that guard a person, um, how you might use the voluntary sharing. Um, so again, you would want to set up a management scenario. So I, if you're familiar with um, Michael Shikashio, he has fabulous talks and fabulous videos where he has some really nice um, management structures um, for safety with dogs that um, guard people. Um, so that's the type of setup I would use. So maybe the dog that guards is, um, you know, there's a gate between that dog and the other dog. Um, and the person is in on the side with the other dog. Um, so you have the dog that guards over here safely behind a gate or in a crate or something like that. That dog performs a behavior that says the person can interact with the other dog. So very similar to the taking turns concept. So that dog could be lying down and putting their chin on the floor. They could be, um, you know, it could be a body position. It could be as simple as just lying down. It could be anything, um, that you have established that that means I can then interact with the other dog, the person interacts with the other dog, this dog gets fed out of place so that they have the opportunity to offer that behavior again to say, yes, you can interact with the other dog. And again, the end goal is for that dog to be more com comfortable with the entire process. And so hopefully over time, that dog that has said, yes, you can interact with that other dog is going to get more comfortable with that interaction and we can move towards getting to the point where we don't have to have that management set up as they get more comfortable um, and always setting that dog up for success so we can get closer and closer to more natural um, setups. Um, so thank you all so much for coming and participating. Um, I uh, hope you all will uh, check out those other resources and I um, highly recommend joining the, uh, I should have said this at the beginning, but um, there is a Facebook group called Friends of Control Unleashed um, that has fabulous information and uh, Leslie McDevitt is very active on there as well as um, fellow certified um, Control Unleashed instructors. Um, so if you have questions or you want to share something or post a video to get feedback on, um, it's a wonderful group, um, very active, uh, very helpful and positive and um, encouraging. That's the word I was looking for. Um, so again, I'll, I'll try and remember to post all of these um, resources for you guys so that you can have them. And um, I hope this was helpful. I loved talking with you guys. And... Um, hopefully we'll um, see you soon or maybe hear from you. I um, Feel free to um, message or post anything on there or join Friends of Control Unleashed and ask your questions there. So, um, all right. Thank you again.